Charlie Angus. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here in the UK with you, Ms. Denham. You used to come to the committee back in Canada when you were the uh, uh, acting uh, representative on privacy issues. So I'd like to begin by talking about um, the Canadian perspective on this, which is Christopher Wiley, Zach Bassingham, Jeff Sylvester, um, and the Canadian connection to the Cambridge Analytica scandal. One of the uh, things that was really striking about what Christopher Wiley said was that how SCL found it convenient to have, uh, to set up a number of players in different jurisdictions. It would be, it was easier for a number of uh, reasons for them to, to run these campaigns. And what we found out when we began our investigation, looking into uh, originally the breach, was that we had you know, two guys above an optometrist shop in Victoria who suddenly came into all this money and may have undermined the Brexit vote, but were beyond the jurisdiction of Britain because they were in Canada. Uh, and then we, you know, subpoenaed them and forced production of documents. But it raises to me the question of the adequacy of tools for dealing with uh, data mercenaries who are set up outside of jurisdictions where they operate and if you can give us any specifics that you think we should address or anything that we may have missed because we're still despite the best efforts of our parliament and um, I, I do think we are willing to, to go into the corners with these guys but we still couldn't get straight answers from aggregate IQ at the end of the day about their corporate structure about how they were set up with SCL and we can we can only go so far so what are the tools that we need to have to be able to constrain or to hold to account data mercenaries who are outside the jurisdictions in which they're operating. So I, I think um, with digital campaigning, with big data politics, with big data commerce, and the fact that personal data is really the assets, asset that's, that's driving the internet, it's extremely important that data protection regulators have the ability to reach beyond their borders, extraterritorial reach, as we have now in the UK, in the EU, we're able to follow the data in that way. But it, it's also very, very important that we have strong enforcement powers. We have powers to be able to compel documentation, to be able to reach into the cloud. Um, beyond in, in a digital search that's very important and during this investigation which is probably the largest data protection investigation that we've ever undertaken um, certainly in Europe we were able we we were able to seize documents and evidence we were able to have 700 terabytes of data from Cambridge Analytica that we're crunching through forensically examining, but we were also able to work with our colleagues in other jurisdictions. Our Canadian colleagues were also collaborating in, with um, law, en law enforcement agencies in the US and the UK and beyond. So I think what's really important, there's nine jurisdictions in this room all concerned about protecting personal data, especially in the context of elections, campaigns and referenda, but even beyond that. And it means that we have to be able to have the tools to work together to collaborate and, and cooperate because this is truly a global issue. So uh, that would be, that's a strong recommendation. Um, just to add a little bit to what the Commission said there as well, I think it's really important that international regulatory cooperation networks are strengthened. So around the world we're still observing that data protection authorities can perhaps have quite weak or limited powers which give them the legal basis to cooperate and share information with their counterparts internationally and longer term we probably need to look like look at things like multilateral treaties we really have quite some strong reciprocal enforcement mechanisms there to really make the extraterritorial scope of our laws as they change work in practice we're still at relatively early stage really as data protection regulators in learning to cooperate around the world because data has no borders now this is a really urgent task in terms of doing that the, the, from the UK perspective, we're now chairing the International Conference of Data Protection Commissioners to try and lead that work, to try to get some more global solutions, but it's going to take time. Lots of different countries need to join this work. Thank you. Well, I have two more questions on that, which has to do with the need to ensure that our regulators have the tools and the teeth. Um, I think it was 2008 or 2009 when you were the Canadian 
Pri Acting Privacy Commissioner, you launched what I understand is the first investigation into Facebook uh, on their loosey-goosey approach to privacy controls, which I believe if they had followed uh, your findings and your rulings, we would never have had the Cambridge Analytica scandal. That was 10 years ago. You didn't have the order-making powers to make them comply, but even if you did, it seems that Facebook has a sense that laws are something that they will consider if it works, and if it doesn't, they will find a way to explain it away or ignore it. In light of what we've dealt with now, uh, you were very prescient back then. Do you think that we could have avoided a lot of this stuff if Cape Facebook had shown some corporate responsibility back when you issued your report? Well, that was, as, as you reminded me, 10 years ago that the report was issued by the Canadian Privacy Commissioner's Office and that report laid bare the business model of Facebook and explained how the advertising model worked, how third-party applications worked, the, um, the openness of the sharing of data with friends and friends of, of friends. But at that time, um, and still today, the Federal Privacy Commissioner in Canada doesn't have order-making power, doesn't have enforcement power. Any, um, any finding has to be enforced by federal court. And I feel that, that Facebook has looked at the Canadian finding and the Canadian recommendations as well as the Irish recommendations as, as more like advice. Mm. And the message I, I heard from Facebook this morning is unless there is a legal order compelling a change in their business model, a change in their practice, then they're not going to do it. And that's, that's a serious statement, but that means that we have to have strong laws and we have to have enforcement tools to, to move online platforms in the right direction so that they take people with them in the services that they offer. Well, and then I'm going to close on this because when you were in Canada, you didn't have the order-making powers. You do now have the order-making powers. You've issued a f substantial fine against Facebook. Uh, and perhaps I didn't hear Mr. Allen correctly, but it seems that your findings of 2009, he still feels, is advisory because it's on uh, principle one about the platform that was constructed uh, to harvest data of friends without consent. Uh, he says that it's all there in the terms of service agreement, um, and he said that this morning. So is Facebook telling us that they believe that they can write terms of service agreements that override uh, the laws of many different countries because that to me is very disturbing. Are you finding that in the appeal that Facebook is making that they're misrepresenting your findings publicly? Because I would find that very disturbing. If we're going to have corporate accountability, if we still see this culture of, uh, Im uh, of a corporate immaturity that they don't think that they need to be truthful or do you feel that they're being accurate in how they represent their uh, a challenge to you and do you think that they respect the necessity to respect the law about these issues of consent? So after, after a nine-month investigation, we, um, we issued a fine in October of this year. It was the maximum fine that was available to us under the previous regime and I stand by the findings and the enforcement action by my office. That said, any organization, any company has the right of appeal. But I was, I was really disappointed by Facebook's statement in the context of the appeal because I do think that they misrepresented the fact of our finding and the rationale for issuing that fine. So the statement that uh, Facebook published last week said that our investigation found no evidence to suggest that the information of Facebook's 1 million UK users was ever shared between Dr. Kogan and Cambridge Analytica or used by affiliates in the Brexit referendum. So that was in Facebook's statement. And that much is correct about our investigation, but our fine wasn't about whether or not UK users was shared in this way. We find Facebook because it allowed application and application developers to harvest the personal information of its customers who had not given their informed consent. So think of friends and, and friends of friends. And then Facebook failed to keep the information safe. 
So in UK terms, that's principle one and principle seven breaches. And that's pretty basic data protection 101. That's about notice and transparency and control. It's not a case of no harm, no foul. Companies are responsible to proactively protect the, the personal information. And that's been the case in the UK for 30 years. So um, Dr. Kogan in Cambridge Analytica is just one example of what Facebook allowed to happen. And what we're talking about here is up to 87 million Facebook users' data represented in the jurisdiction, uh, jurisdictions of those of you around the table. So Facebook wrote data, data protection law, and it's disingenuous for Facebook to compare that to email forwarding because that's not what it's about. It's about the release of users' profile information without their knowledge and consent. That's messages and likes. That's their profile. So I guess at the end of the day, I'm really disappointed that one of the most innovative companies in the world, because great things happen on Facebook, have not replicated their innovation in ways that protect people's privacy online. That's how. That's how I would summarize it, Mr. Angus. Great. Thank you. Nathan Eskin Smith.